Well, welcome again to another Fighting Football and Faith. Um, we're having it around the table, really, with some of the guys, just having a chat about things that really matter. Um, it's great today to have Pastor Lance with us from a Legacy Church in Warsaw. Uh, Lance has been refereeing for 25 years. Uh, obviously, the great Peter Oden Wingy, uh, ex Albion, um, and um, incredible striker. Um, we're going to talk about some of his red cards a bit later on, even though he doesn't want us to. And then Jay <laughs> Astley, professional boxing coach and bodyguard. And uh, thank you guys for joining me um, as we just talk about some things that really, really stand out for guys. So I want to talk a little bit about respect um, on this session. So Lance, obviously you've had 25 years with refereeing, refereeing different clubs and, and teams. Um, talk a little bit about respect and what it means to you as the man in the middle of the park. Yeah, um, gosh, where do I begin? We always say as referees, we've got stories. We could write a book about it, the amount of things that we see and we experience. And um, I remember the first time I um, decided that I was going to have a go at refereeing a football match and didn't expect um, the amount of questioning of almost every single decision that you make that happens with certain individuals um and one of the things that i learned through the refereeing is that we're all different as referees and we all have different tolerance levels and um i remember i used to play football as well and um, I was never abusive to a referee. I've never never got sent off anything like that. But I'd moan just like the rest of the players at decisions and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm the kind of referee um, that would try and uh, have banter with the players. Um, but there's always one who steps on your corn, who... who who's, it seems like his job's there to, to, to get to you as quick as possible. And I've refed at a decent standard as well. I was on the um, FA Premier Football League Reserves, so that's a decent level of football. And I was doing the academy football as well. And I remember doing one particular game and um, it was, some of you, you should know, Martin O'Connor played for Walsall. Yeah. His brother was playing in this game and um, I had him in the book probably in about a minute and a half because I just thought if I don't, if I don't do this now, because it was a, it was a game that I was doing where I was asked to do it, where a lot of refs just didn't want to touch it. So I had him in the book after a minute and a half and it just calmed everything down again, it just calmed everything down. And I'm the, I'm the kind of referee that will just let the players get on and play. But the, 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 the one area I think, that the FA is still getting it wrong is the area around the way that players are allowed to speak to officials. And I'll give you a quick example of that. The Man United Villa game, there's no fans in the ground, which means the, the, the mics pick up everything, almost everything that the players say. And my mate, who's a, a, a Wolves supporter and a season ticket holder, messaged me while the game was on and said, did you just hear what Jack Grealish said to the assistant referee? And I said, no, because I'm watching the game on my phone, so I didn't pick it up. And he said it was disgraceful. And one of the things that the FA do is they tell the um, young academy kids and they tell the parents about respecting officials and respecting um, opponents, and yet still at top level, we still have officials who have been abused by players and they just seem to get away with it. And you, you can't have one rule for, for, for top pros and another rule for grassroots football. And uh, for me, my tolerance level is I can put up with the moaning, I can put up with the questioning of decisions to a level, but when it turns abusive, that's that's when my tolerance level's gone and I get rid of people very quickly. That's great, Lance. Thanks for filling us in on that. Pete, obviously you've played more games than you wish to remember. How many red cards, Pete? I'm sure you do remember. Um, three that I remember of. I think there were three. Another hat trick. 
<laughs> Let's not talk about Atsuk, shall we? Um, yes. So, and uh, all three. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean no, to. No, no. You, can't, you can't help yourself, can you, Peter? Uh, I see. I see Jay. Jay gone so bright right away. <laughs> all right. So, um, and again, uh, all three are respect related, and no coincidence. Now we have a referee here. Uh, because the first one wasn't a direct red card. It was, um, it was uh, a yellow card first because I pulled the shoulder of the referee like to get his attention because a lot of people were in his face, but I was on his side. So I pulled his shoulder like to say something, you know, because I felt that I, I had the answer to the situation. So I pulled his shoulder so he turns at me. So he booked me for that. That, that was my first yellow. Yeah. And then um, after that, the second yellow was a 50-50 ball with the goalkeeper, which I uh, like took the ball off him. But he, he said my leg was uh, too high. That was dangerous play. Although there was no malice in it, uh, you know, I still hit him in the chest. So anyway, I get that send off. But it, the first one, the uh, yellow, was because of disrespect, kind of. And I will accept it. You know, I will say, OK. Uh, it wasn't malice, like it was a bit, but it was rude. I can say it was rude, so there's no need for that. Um, then the second one was against Fulham. I lashed out as, uh, you know, the tolerance levels went as well, because before they passed the ball to me, the defender, Sasha, we had a laugh about it as we played a friendly game against them in uh, in Germany after Stoke with his uh, Cologne, it was, I think he was in playing in Germany then. He admitted also, he said, yeah, I know, I know, but I don't know if he meant it or not. But before I went for a ball, he stepped on my foot. And you know, the, wrist, the boots I use are very thin because I want them to be as light as possible so I can run faster. So they are very sensitive to anyone stepping on your foot, you know. So before I even went, these are the tricks of defenders. He literally stamps on my foot and he, he wore metal studs. And it, yeah. it was so painful, but nobody noticed, you know, and we were not far from the fourth referee. Or he was in the middle of the pit. So when I went, uh, you know, and after that, uh, there was another collision. They went hard on me. And I just went, no, I'm not accepting this. And this is when you, this like levels of uh, like, tolerance as, uh, I forgot your name, sorry. Lance. Lance just said, levels of tolerance. There is a minimum you expect from people. And soon as the minimum is not there, you, you can call it a bare minimum. So when you don't get a bare minimum, I think, you know, it's easier to, to snap. That's why we have to demand from each other not to have like chaos. Uh, every time chaos on the pitch or, you know, from supporters, between supporters, between everybody, you know, there is a bare minimum that we have to adhere to. And when that's not happening, that's when we all uh, kind of, you are justified to kind of lose your cool, you know, at the moment. Of course, you have to repent after, as the word says, don't let the sun go down, you know, <laughs> in, in your anger. So, and then the third one is in Indonesia. It was a very crucial game, and it was very obvious. They were the captain of the team. He wanted to hurt me like on purpose. He double tackled, like two feet tackle, and I even have uh, images of it. I have a big bruise on my foot and near my knee, like on top on my shin. So he went on purpose. There was no ch thinking of going for the ball because that game, if they won it, they were becoming champions of Indonesia. And I was the key man, even called the marquee player of my team. So he went really hard to take me out of the game. But what happened is they only booked him a yellow card. That was a red card normally. And maybe even they should suspend him for like three months. I'll show you the video, actually. But he only got a yellow card. It's a bit corrupt, the, the league, you know. So uh, it was an army club as well. They let us not have any of our fans. So there were other things to consider, you know, why I lost my head. Because they didn't let us have fans. They, uh, you know, they, I saw it as a plan from them to just like get me hurt so they can win the league. So that I felt like this is no respect. And I went after him like two minutes after. I'm like, I'm going to kick this guy. So I just run at him and lashed at him. I just kicked him, you know. So and then I get red card. I get sent off. You know, I leave and I'm like, and inside of me, I'm like, we as players, we can't put somebody's life before any result, even if it's World Cup final. So if he hurt me, like I have children at home, you know, I, I, this is how I feed my family. I take care of lots of people in Nigeria. Like you can't go and like, he literally could end my career. They have a fracture on my, I will show you the photos. I took photos of how swollen my leg was and the tackle is bad. 
you know, this, when you don't have a bare minimum, I think it's okay to react in one way. You understand why somebody will react. I had that with like Robert Huth a few times. You know, the ball is in the other side of the pitch and he just like hits you like the, no one is there. And then we start punching each other, but the ball is on the other side of the pitch. But now me and Robert Huth were like top friends, you know, but they do things like this to provoke you sometimes, you know, a lot of things happens on the pitch where the camera is away, you know, uh, like Zinedine Zidane, we all remember when he headbutted Materazzi. And this is like when you don't have the bare minimum, even the elite players of the world lose their head because Materazzi said something about his family and then he reacted, he headbutted him. And now the whole world remembers Zidane for that. But Zidane is the coolest, calmest guy you can imagine. But there are some things you just don't accept for anyone. And that's what we call the bare minimum. And respect yeah. is the beginning. You know, the Lord Jesus gave us, you know, love your neighbor, love your enemy as yourself. But okay, we are trying to attain perfection, you know, like uh, holiness. But we are still, you know, we still have this sinful nature in us. And uh, to control that, we, that's why we demand at least minimum respect. And that's why the Champions League shirts have respect on it because it's for everyone's good because if you don't there will be no order at all on the pitch off the pitch if we don't have the minimum which is called respect but thank god we are of those who seek uh, holiness not respect so but you know we are all uh, have a role to play to be uh, role models to set examples you know mm -hmm. when i was wrong i admit i'm wrong you know so that that doesn't build and continue so the younger ones don't learn mm -hmm. as uh least lights just said you know what's on the top level has to happen in the and the at the lower level and mm. it's really important to like uh, you know know you are responsible for your actions because the younger ones if you're an elite the younger ones that are making their first steps they are watching you if they repeat something you're doing they might never have even a career so Absolutely. it can go as bad as that well they would say confession is good for the soul pete so thanks for confessing up to those <laughs> Right, I'm, going to come to, I'm going to come to Jay. Um, obviously, contact sport in terms of, of real contact sport is boxing. And uh, you've been in the ring many, many times, Jay, um, coaching, fighting, um, there between the ref and, and somebody else. Uh, how important is respect um, in terms of, of the ring? Um, first of all, I've, I've got to confess something, Pasta. Yeah. Some, I've never shared with anybody, even though I've been arguing my testimony hundreds of times. I actually got banned from playing football at the age of 31 because I punched the referee and knocked him out. Oh, which no. is Jason, a Jason, terrible Jason. thing to I've never ever confessed it. I'm confessing it now. If you check the Birmingham County football, you'll find that I'm banned, sorry, and die. Nobody could never sign me. And that and that was the most disrespectful thing I, thing I ever did. But I think it's about time I got that off my chest. Well done. Um, it's, it's off my chest. <laughs> Man. But that that also that can also turn into a different person. When I found Jesus, I'm a new creation. I'm not that kind of person anymore. But I, I think when that happened to me, I got arrested by the police as well for that offence. Well, I got arrested by the police and I got I got banned out to keep the peace in the court of law. Um, that learnt me lesson as well because I had to finish playing football, and I love playing football more. I love boxing. I went back into boxing. I went to, I boxed as a kid. But in the football, my love was football because I said footballs get more girls than, than boxers because we, we all got busted noses. Um, so I had to go back into boxing. So I did. I then became, I, I, was, I, still, I was fighting at the time. I then became a coach. And um, I think that learnt me a lot. That me missing football learnt me so much that I then took into boxing. And then telling kids, when I'm coaching kids, I said to kids that, if I find out at school and I'm doing what I'm learning to do in the playground, you'll never set foot, foot through that door again into the gym. This is a, a human game of chess. That's what I call boxing, a human game of chess. I also share with the adults and the kids as I'm training people. Take the word lose, loss, loss out your mouth, out, out your psyche, out your brain, out your mind. And we never lose. We either win or we learn. We never lose. In boxing, you don't lose. You win or you learn. And that's a big thing you could take into life. Life in general. You win or you learn. On that day when I did that, that referee on the football pitch at Stowbridge, 
I um, I learned. I learned. I know one day I'll, I'll get to that guy one day and I'll, I'll be able to say sorry to him. Mm. This is what God does. He puts you in places where you can repent and really change the way you, you live, your, live your life. Mm. But yeah, in a boxing ring, it's not like a football referee. The referee in boxing is the boss. You know, you even play your cheek, you even swear or do anything wrong like you're out. And sometimes it's so hard because back, you've been punched in the face. You've been punched in the stomach. Sometimes you get punched below the waist, <laughs> which is something I should do sometimes to slow people down. It happens, you know, this is reality. I, I, when you speak, I'm never going to lie to you, you know. It's reality. But respect for referees in football... I don't think it's quite right. Even though I was one of the bad people myself, it's not right. Respect for boxing referees, it is bang on. Smack on the nail. Mm. You know, after the fight, you always see boxers, even the ones that lose, will touch gloves with the referee, touch gloves with the fighter, touch gloves with the other corner. And that's after you've been beat up badly by a massive guy, because I'm an heavyweight, when I've been beat up by somebody, I have to go to the corner and and, and touch those fist bump and referees the the people outside the ring as well. So yeah, respecting boxing is massive. And I always say to all the fighters that after this fight's finished, win, lose, draw, or learn, you have to respect the other person you fought against. And if it comes about that you've got to learn, or most people say loss, lose, if it comes about that you've got to learn, then that's what you've got to do. I will look back at the fight on video after and correct your mistakes. I think, you know, we respect. Respect is a lot about correction, isn't it? But when you respect someone, I respect Pastor Steve so high, it's unreal. But if I was up to say something wrong to him, which I shouldn't do, I have to learn, I have to learn that lesson. So respect and learning is basically the same thing. Yeah, and yeah, in boxing, I won't have it. Even though I was naughty myself, I won't have it. If any of the fighters I'm taking in to fight or to box and they be cheeky to the referee or even the other person's corner or even the other person's mum and dad who could be swearing to him from the side of the ring, if they do that, any of my boxes, that kind of thing, nah. I'm not training no more. Find another gym. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the refereeing standards as well, I think in rugby are quite high as well, guys, aren't they? You know, as, a, as another sport, just to, just as an aside, um, a lot more respect show to rugby referees than, than football referees. Um, can, I, can, I just, can I just throw in there, Steve? Um, the um, last season was the introduction of sin bins in football. And the season before, they trialled it in a couple of leagues. And um, they introduced it at grassroots level right across the country last season. And the respect, the respect for referees almost instantaneously changed overnight at grassroots level. Yeah. You know, because players know if you, if you dissent the referee, you're going to get 10 minutes yeah. in the sin bin, as I call it. And that gives the players a chance to just calm themselves down and reflect. And I've never had to, I've never had to send anybody to the sin bin twice because I learned the first time. Mm. And all the clubs, managers of the clubs, players, all said I think it's a great thing. It's needed at grassroots level to improve respect for the officials. So I'll throw that in there. Yeah, that's bro. That's bro. We've talked about respect. Um, I think for all of us, um, I would say as a pastor, you're as professionals in, in your areas, um, self-respect is something that's really, really important. If you can't respect yourself and how you behave yourself, that has a huge impact on your game, your performance as a, as a church leader, as a boxing coach, as a footballer. So um, it's important in it, Pete, um, in football to have respect not only for those around you, but for yourself as well. Um, yes, yes, of course, because that sets uh, standards uh, of what you expect. And at the same time, 
you know, what goes around comes around. So, you know, you what you sow is what you reap. So then, you know, when you have set the standards of how somebody can approach you or treat you, then you are, it's a law by itself, right? So we, 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 it's a law where we have to keep ourselves and, you know, and that's, uh, it's the substance of, you know, of our, let's say, walk, our character. So yes, of course, uh, self-respect, because if you don't know boundaries, you cannot offer anybody boundaries either. So once you know a boundary, you're like, okay, if I don't accept this for myself, I, I cannot do that for anybody else. So it's a, it's a kind of common yeah. sense. Yeah, I mean, for me, when I think about some of the great players, the most gifted, talented players, have thrown away just from lack of self-respect. You know, the gazers of this world. You know, Gascoigne, what a player he was. Um, yet struggled with his own self, you know, his old self. You know, um, there's, there's dozens you can think of that have, have been incredibly talented, probably better than footballers than some of the guys that have gone on to succeed. But because of lack of self-respect, have just have plummeted and burned, you know. George Best, I don't maybe. think it's a, it's a lack of self-respect there because they'll come into this because the PFA, like, they're doing things. As Lance just said, when you bring in some corrections, mm. it does have an effect. So now they've realized that mental struggles after careers, because, you know, even on the level of um, the fact that you were adored for so, such a long time, you played in front of crowds and you were the man, you score goals, a lot of dopamine, you cannot replace that feeling and something is missing in your life. So they realize that psychologically players struggle a lot. So there is a support line for players, you know, after retirement, even myself, you know, the FA, uh, you know, bless them, a uh, few people, they've tried to like bring you in. Do you want to do coaching? Do you want to do this? Well, they, they check on you. What do you want to do? So FIFA offered me a role in one of the, in the Women's World Cup. I have some work with BBC because the kind of thing is, at the end of your career, you feel like the game itself that you loved with all your heart, you gave it all, you will do anything to be fit, to score for your fans, for the club, you know, you treated them, you gave them your all and you expect some loyalty back from the game. And soon as you retire and towards the end, I had that feeling and this is me and, and I just mentioned to you that I felt support to an extent, maybe first two years, no, all of a sudden, no offers, no contracts, no, no attention. No help that you were used to. You're not in the queues anymore. You walk in a restaurant, they, 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 they already like uh, find you the best table. You know, all these things go overnight, you know? So, and then your income drops as well. Uh, the respect, some, you lose a lot of friends who you thought were your friends. So elite athletes have to deal with a lot of things. And all people, we're just same, you know, you succeeded a lot, but you are just the same person that you can have a heartbreak from people like not giving you a ring anymore. Those guys that will be like, oh, can I get a ticket uh, every every week? Like, I want to watch you, support you. You realize that some of them were not your friends. You realize that, you know, uh, there is always a next hero. This world, you cannot rely on them. That's why we have faith, you know. That's why every day today I speak to people. I'm like, hey, don't look at me like Peter the Wing, the football player that I was like uh, the star. Because at the end of the day, before I became that uh, popular football, I was just a guy supporting the guys who were on the pitch. And now I'm off the pitch. So firstly, you're a person. Secondly, you're a professional in any area. So these are the things that you have to deal with. Like, that's why people, a lot of problems. I had an interview last year. Lots of players behind the scene. People don't know they're suffering. They are into gambling. They're into alcohol. Lots of them. Because one, one uh, journalist called me, said, Pete, I'm so impressed that you picked up you want to do a degree in golf, you're trying to do your coaching badges later. I see you have a plan, but I've been talking to a few of the guys who played, some were suicidal, some tried to commit suicide, some of this, some of that. You know, they go into addictions and it's a problem. But now, thankfully, you know, there are lines, you people call the FPFA, they offer you help, counseling, they try and get you involved like the baggies. I don't know how it is with the wolves, but we, the baggies, we kind of look after our own the, the former players association, I go on meetings now and then, meet the fans in like some pubs. We have a good chat and photos. We have a QA. and a They take me to the stadium, give me a nice seat. But I don't know how it is in the Molyneux, but we're doing well on that side. So yeah. these are little things that are changing because clubs give a bit of funding to the associations. 
to the like to support those people so that they still feel that respect that the fans had for them once it never disappeared you have the photos in the stadium of the older people so i walked in and i saw my hat trick uh, photo in one of let's the not talk let's not talk about that peter come on let's not so it's that important to support <laughs> <laughs> the lord said i will never leave you nor forsake you till the end of the earth you will be with us always so we have to uh, rely on things that never fade so that's why faith is such an important part of our life and you know it will you know we will do everything and he will uh he will you know give us strength when we're weak amen that's absolutely amen. right and you know this is our fourth session of talking together and every time we've talked we've come back to this same premise that without christ we're absolutely nothing you know pete you were praying at an elite level as you say fans were roaring your name uh people at the morning you were cursing your name you know all of that was going on and yet you were just a normal flesh and foot blown bloke like the rest of us, having to deal with a lot of pressure and issues. Uh, but thanks be to God for our faith, Peter, that's uh, brought us through. So I'd like Jay to finish off and pray. I mean, Jay's been in a lot of fights with referees and fights without referees. That would be true to say. Um, yeah. but, but again, found a living faith in Jesus. And I think what we want to try to communicate as guys here, like we're just real, you know, we're trying to keep it real. We love our football. We love our boxing and, rugby and all the other stuff that we we do uh, but we found a peace and a joy that you can't you can't exchange for money in, in all the world you know when you come into a relationship with jesus christ he just completely changes you from the inside out and uh, we're really grateful for that and i, I just i just love being with the guys and love, love especially jay's honesty and um you know you, you, you can say he's got a checkered past pete's got a, a you know got, got like a, almost like a history he's like when i think about pete coming to our church if I was a Wolves fan, it's, you know, I am a Wolves fan. It's like Steve Bull coming to my church, except he's the Albion version. So the Lord's got a wicked sense of humour, really. Um, mm. <laughs> but then for Jay to come, probably in a million years, Jay and I would have walked completely two sides of a road. Uh, but we're brothers together in Christ, and it's just an amazing thing. So Jay, yeah. just just tell people about the Lord, and then let's pray and ask God to meet people right now. Yeah, yeah, I am. I am one hundred percent living proof. That God will make you a new, a new person, a new creation, a new being, a new life. I'm a fantastic husband now, and I, I say it with confidence, not be bragging or boasting. But I know I'm a fantastic husband. I'm a fantastic father. I'm a fantastic friend, and I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be strong and say, you know what? I am a fantastic Christian. That's who I want to be. That's who Jesus has made me. I was a very violent man who thrived on hurting people. For a living, for the buzz, for the crack. I love, I used to love being a violent man, but Jesus made me a new, a new creation, a new man. If anybody's uh, watching yeah. this, if anybody's watching this who, who wants to start that path, please get in touch with the Sedley Church. We'll pray with you, we'll help you, we'll pick you up when you fall, and we'll push you forward when you're flowing. You know, this is what Jesus does. He changed lives, he changed my life, he can change yours. So I appeal to anybody who wants that, who needs that, who's thinking about that, reach out. Reach out and we'll help you. Um, I'm just going to pray for everyone now. Um, Father God in heaven, I love be your name, Father. Mm. Father, I love you with every breath of God. I thank you, Father, for everything you've done for me. For, what you, for the future and you do for other people I thank you for my wife, my daughter I thank you for my church I thank you for Pastor Stephen the elders and the leaders at Chesley Church just great people I thank you for a new, a new, a new friend in Jesus, a new brother in Jesus in, in Pastor Lance Father, I thank you for Peter Father, I used to go to West Bromwich and I'd thinking, oh I'd love to know that Peter or the and next thing you know I'm sitting in church with him come on man Come on, I just giggle when I think about this, Jesus, because it's like, it's crazy. People said, they'll meet your heroes. Well, my hero's my brother. You know, I'll say it with confidence that uh, anybody needs to reach out for Jesus, just reach. Just ask him, Jesus, come into my life. Mm -hmm. Come into my life yeah. and help me change. Mm -hmm. I praise the name of Jesus that people have confidence to do this. Lord, I just want to thank you for the blessings. I want to thank you for everything you did for us. I thank you, my brothers and my sisters. Jesus, I just thank you for everything. Everything I've got is down to you, Jesus. I thank you so much. Amen.
Amen. Guys, Amen. thank you so much for your time. Jay, uh, I know you're at work and you spent the time in your lunch hour doing this, so thank you for that. Pastor Lance, great insight into refereeing and um, what you're doing in the football community and really bless you at church there in Warsaw. And uh, Peter Oden Wingy, I still can't believe you're part of our church, but I love you anyway, my friend. And uh, Maybe me and Jay can come to the Molyneux one day. I'll see how good he was in football before the knocking <laughs> out of the referee. So I'll see if he... <laughs> I'll see why he knocked the referee out. Was it out of frustration that he couldn't score or something? Yeah. No, no, Peter, Peter. I, I was a defensive midfield player. And I've okay. never ever scored. I scored this goal. And the guy cleared it off the line, but it was behind the line. So I'll argue with the lineman saying, That's the answer. Line, you need to put your All right. up. So, what, what we will do is we'll go to the mall and you one day, uh, hopefully, they let us, and you can just score a goal there, then, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and listen. then I will apologise to all Wolves fans. At the Mate, end. listen, there's no, there's no need to apologise. Um, you know, we've, we've said it. We've got a lads group, uh, Pastor Lance. We've got a lads group that we've got a WhatsApp group. There's, there's, a, there's probably two dozen of us on lads, and we do banter about our football. But at the end of the day, we, we keep it, we keep it honest and real. Mm. And, and our love is more so for each other and uh, mm. for the Lord. So um, it's Amen. great to have chat with you all again. And uh, we'll see you the next time. So uh, God bless you all. And uh, okay. see you, see you, and you Steve. Cheers. And you. Thank you.